Hello again, uh, I am Jackie Cornejo with the Housing Department, and today I'm presenting along with staff of the Department of City Planning. Thank you for joining us to learn more about the plan to house LA, the update to the City of LA's housing element for years 2021 through 2029. Today we will be providing uh, information regarding targeted updates to the safety and health elements as well. If you experience any technical difficulties, um, please email housing element, one word, at lacity.org. Next slide. The housing element is an interdepartmental effort led by the housing department and city planning. From the housing department today, I have my colleague and our general manager, Ann Sewell, joining us. And from city planning, we have Matt Glesney, Blair Smith, and Wajia Ibrahim. We will also hear from Connie Polini Tipton and Ari Brisky from City Planning, who will be presenting today on the safety and health elements. This webinar is being broadcast on Facebook Live and GoToWebinar. If you are participating on GoToWebinar, you will be muted by default throughout this presentation. For those joining us through GoToWebinar, if you would like to provide a comment or ask a question that can be done through the chat on the control panel as shown in the blue arrows. We will respond to these questions near the end during the Q&A. We also want to point out that there are additional materials for you to access through the handouts icon on the control panel. You will find a copy of the slides for this webinar along with two fact sheets about the housing element. Click the name of a handout to access it and a pop-up will appear asking if you would like to view or automatically start downloading from your default web browser. We will also be taking polls throughout the webinar using menti.com. To participate in the poll, you can either scan the QR code by opening your phone camera app and facing it at the code over your screen or you can go to benti.com and input the number you see on the screen. This can be done on any device that has access to the internet, like a smartphone or a tablet. And to those watching via Facebook, while we are broadcasting the webinar on a different platform, you'll also be able to participate in our polls. If we don't get to your question, again, you can email us at housingelement at lacity.org. Let's start with the agenda for today's presentation. We'll start with an overview of the project, then provide an overview of the housing element draft. Next, we'll provide a brief overview of the safety and health element, walk through some next steps and a lot of time for questions. The duration of this webinar is approximately 90 minutes. If we do go uh, over time on the Q&A, a few staff would be happy to stay a few extra minutes to ensure we answer as many questions as we can. As indicated here, the plan to house LA covers the years 2021 through 2029. Recent state laws require the city to review and update the safety element alongside the housing element. While the housing element is undergoing a comprehensive update to the, to the safety element, it's targeted, amendment, targeted to amendments that bring the existing element into state law compliance, often by referencing or integrating other long range plans already in place. The majority of this presentation will focus on the housing element with some background on the safety element towards the end. Uh, the question and answer is focused on both elements. The housing element is one of the, one of the 12 current general plan elements for the city of Los Angeles. The general plan sets high level citywide policy and vision. And because Los Angeles is so large, we have, 20, we have 35, excuse me, 35 community plans that make up the land use element of the general plan. Each community plan includes zoning, which details what can be built on an individual parcel, as well as policies specific to that geographic area. City planning is currently working to update all community plans in the general plan with 16 active community plan updates. The general plan, community plans, land use, and zoning designations are all interrelated but fundamentally different ways the city works to address housing and community needs throughout Los Angeles. The 16 active community plans have been working in close coordination with us to ensure consistency across planning efforts. Next slide. Okay, so let's begin with our overview of the housing element. Next slide. 
Housing elements were established by the state of California in 1969 as a mandatory part of the general plan. The state requires that jurisdictions do their fair share to plan for adequate affordable housing. These requirements recognize that housing is a critical need and that the government and private sector must work together to address the needs of all residents. Under state law, the housing element must be updated every eight years. Failing to comply can result in loss of funding for critical services and programs related to housing, transportation, and other infrastructure. The housing element serves dual purposes for the city. It sets housing policy and program direction, and practically speaking, it is used when reviewing projects and policies. It includes analysis of our existing housing conditions, needs, and strategies for addressing them. Our regional housing needs allocation, or RENA, informs housing goals and determines the need for rezoning. Recent state legislation requires the city to review and update as necessary the safety element alongside the housing element. As part of the safety element 2021 update to the city, uh, the city will, re will integrate targeted amendments into the existing document to better illustrate the city's approach to disaster management and resilience. Here we lay out a timeline for achieving key milestones starting last winter in 2020 through the adoption in a few months. There have been many opportunities throughout this update process to provide feedback and help shape the city's vision and plan for housing. We began the outreach process in the visioning phase last spring, and we released the draft plan on July 1st of this year. This plan is on a strict and somewhat expedited timeline because the state requires that the housing element be adopted by October 2021. We plan to release the joint housing element and safety element uh, draft environmental impact report later this month and release a revised draft of the housing element in early September. Within our outreach with the public, we've heard a lot. We've also summarized these comments and ideas into a couple of key topic areas. These include protect renters and prevent displacement, pro produce more housing, especially affordable housing, plan and zone for inclusive communities, prioritize the most vulnerable, address the homelessness crisis, promote livable and resilient neighborhoods, promote more affordable and ownership opportunities. If you're interested in learning more about the feedback we've received so far, a summary of the vision and concept phase of outreach is available in the executive summary of the draft or, and, not or, and Appendix 0 0.1. Next slide. In summary, these are the six concepts we have developed and they fall under these six themes we see on the screen. They are housing stability and anti-displacement, housing production, especially affordable housing, access to opportunity, prevent and end displacement, and homelessness, excuse me, built environment, which captures health, livability, and sustainability, and meeting the needs of all Angelinos. If you are interested in listening in more detail to our concepts for the housing element, you can find our recording of our concepts webinar on the city planning page. Next slide. The city's housing element update, or the plan to house LA, offers a blueprint to addressing the city's immense housing needs in a way that reflects the city's values. It balances production, protection, and preservation, creates a new set of citywide housing priorities that are integrated into many key policies and objectives, and lays out specific strategies and programs associated with these priorities. Next slide. Each chapter covers the housing elements components. Chapter one looks at the city's housing needs, including who is served by the housing stock, how well they are being served and who isn't. Chapter two analyzes constraints to housing development and preservation, including the exist, including existing affordable housing stock and what needs to be preserved. Chapter three looks at the link between housing and conservation efforts in the city. Chapter four looks at process and methodology for identifying sites adequate for housing based on our arena. Chapter five provides a review of the 2013 through 2021 housing element or our current plan. 
And chapter six lays out an action plan of the goals, policies, and implementation programs to help us realize our vision for this next plan. Next slide. You can find a draft uh, on the Department of City Planning's website, or as you can see here, planning.lacity.org forward slash plan to house LA. The draft page also includes two fact sheets, which you can download under the materials tab and go to webinar. So before diving into the goals and objectives for the housing element update, let's take stock of the state of housing and the factors that determine costs, needs, and priorities as outlined in chapter one, housing needs assessment. Chapter one outlines the following key areas you can see here on this list. The overall objective of this chapter is to document the city's tremendous housing needs, its connection to the housing shortage, and the disproportionate impact experienced by communities of color and special needs populations. Next slide. The result is that housing affordability is a big challenge for most major cities today. However, Los Angeles has a higher percentage of those cost burdens than any other major American city. Almost half of all households spend more than a third of their income on rent. In Los Angeles, there are nearly 362,000 severely cost burdened households or 27% of all households. About 32% of all renters in the city of Los Angeles are severely cost burdened and about 19% of owners are experiencing the same. Overcrowding is due to a number of factors, one of the most important being the total number of housing units compared to its total population. Next slide, great. Cost burden and overcrowded conditions are factors that point to rising housing costs resulting from a severely limited supply. Los Angeles has the, low, the fewest number of homes per adult. And if we had sufficient housing per adult, we would have 130,000 more homes in the city today. Increased demand means higher prices for renters and prospective homeowners. The median household price, or the median home price, has jumped to a high of $860,000. And as of June 2021, the median asking rents for a two bedroom apartment in the city are $2,750 a month. We also look at income and employment patterns in Los Angeles and how those match up with housing costs. In this last housing element cycle, median income has grown by 27%. However, city residents overall still earn less than the rest of the county, state, or the nation. You can see here the top five jobs projected to have the most job openings over the next decade, and most of them pay less than $30,000 a year. The result is that younger Angelinos cannot afford to live independently, as evidenced by the increase in residents in the 25 to 34 age range, yet fewer households. Overall, there are fewer owner-occupied households as well, um, with home ownership under those under 45 declining by 25%. There's also been an increase in the number of renters and smaller family sizes, as we've seen trends pointing to individuals postponing or skipping starting a family altogether. Next slide. Okay. The city of Los Angeles has remained a growing city throughout its history. It's grown faster this decade than the prior and is forecasted to increase considerably in the following decades. Though we have seen some changes in the distribution of population across the city, as evidenced by population declines in Bel Air, Sun Valley, Venice, and West Adams, um, with some losses not as focused in the central areas as they had been in the prior decade. You can see those in this map uh, in pink. Regardless, there is a tremendous existing need for housing, as seen by some of the figures we just walked through in the needs assessment on overcrowding, cost burden, and growth in our unhoused population. It's also important to point out that these burdens are not equally felt across all populations. Women and people of color are the most affected with Latinx, Black or African-American women experience the highest rate of rent burden in the city. The number of sheltered, unsheltered persons in Los Angeles has dramatically increased over the last decade, the vast majority being Black or African-American and Latinx. The state, uh, state housing element law requires an analysis of the housing needs of people who have special needs or fall under certain protected classes. 
the plan builds on the analysis to include seniors, large families, individuals with disabilities. And for the first time, we include analysis of LGBT, LGBTQ individuals. Uh, we also include individuals living with HIV AIDS, female headed households and farm workers. When you're looking for a place to live in Los Angeles, what do you look for in your neighborhood? Based on what we've heard in our series of webinars on the housing element, co housing element concepts last year, residents look for access to green space, great schools, and access to public transportation and walkability. Here we see opportunity maps or resource maps created by the state intended to display which areas offer low-income children greater access to economic advancement, higher educational attainment, and good physical and mental health. High resource areas have not built as much housing, especially affordable housing compared to areas without these amenities or resources. Access to opportunity is simply not available in every neighborhood. Within high opportunity areas, there are also environmental constraints such as sea level rise and fire hazards that are important considerations. As we plan for development in the city, the housing element prioritizes access to opportunity in balance with ecological considerations. A new requirement for this cycle is that a housing element must affirmatively further fair housing. This means the housing element must proactively seek to advance the goals of the Fair Housing Act and reduce racially and ethnically concentrated poverty and disparities in access to opportunity. In compliance with Assembly Bill 686, the housing element will include an AFFH analysis that looks at the disparities in access to opportunity, how the city currently enforces fair housing laws, how we intend to identify new strategies for implementing goals and priorities for the city so that we have more integrated and thriving neighborhoods. The draft includes initial findings and framework for our analysis that will be part of the final draft released later, uh, in, later in the fall. Chapter four, which we will go into later, also includes a required AFFH analysis. I will now pass it along to Matt Glesney in city planning who will cover the next few chapters of the plan. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you so much, Jackie. My name is Matt Glesney. I'm a senior city planner with the Department of City Planning. I'll be walking you through the remainder of the chapters, including a high level summary of chapter two here, which is titled Constraints to Housing Maintenance, Improvement and Development. Next slide. This analysis looks at governmental, non-governmental constraints, as well as constraints and barriers that are specific to providing and building housing for people with disabilities. We also identify ongoing and new strategies for how to address and alleviate these constraints in order to meet arena and housing challenges. Finally, the analysis also includes uh, challenges and opportunities to preserving deed-restricted affordable housing and other at-risk units. Uh, and please note that uh, there's quite a lot uh, in this analysis, much of which we've put into an appendix um, if you're really interested in the details. Next slide, please. Uh, a few of the key constraints or barriers that are highlighted in this chapter include, uh, first of all, the lack of suitably zoned land where affordable housing can actually be built. Uh, as you can see on the map, about 70% of all the land where residential uses are allowed permit only single family homes, and only 17% allows for true multifamily development at densities that allow for affordable housing. They're in the dark brown. And despite gains in the last few years in securing additional funding sources, uh, such as the affordable housing linkage fee and Proposition HHH, uh, the city needs significantly more preservation and construction of new affordable housing. In addition, higher labor requirements coupled with higher material costs, such as lumber and steel, also contribute to higher per unit costs for building housing in Los Angeles. And lastly, this chapter. Uh, describes community opposition and risk uh, to citing particularly affordable housing as a contributor to escalating housing costs, which speaks to the need to identify strategies to alleviate all of these constraints. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Next, we'll go into our chapter three, which is looking at opportunities for conservation and res residential development. Next slide. Chapter three highlights the conservation efforts being made by the city of Los Angeles, which aim to both reduce energy and water consumption at the consumer level through our regular usage, 
as well as to minimize the need or demand for non-renewable energy and water sources citywide. We, we largely rely on the strategies outlined in an important recently development uh, plans that were recently developed by the city, including the sustainability plan, which is known as LA's Green New Deal, as well as updates to the LA Green Building Code, the resiliency plan, and the One Water 2040 plan. This chapter also addresses building design and land use planning initiatives, which contribute to conservation, such as green building programs, um, green energy incentive programs, as well as the promotion of infill projects and mixed use development uh, and transit oriented sustainable development that lowers vehicles, vehicle trips and greenhouse gas emissions. This includes programs such as the transit oriented communities or TOC program, as well as other state and local initiatives. Next slide, please. Moving on to chapter four, uh, which is very important as it does describe uh, this kind of centerpiece of, of housing element law, which is the RENA, the Regional Housing Needs Assessment Allocation, and then the city's ability to accommodate our housing needs through our adequate sites. Next slide, please. As a background, uh, through the housing element process, all jurisdictions in California are allocated a regional housing needs assessment or RENA number every eight years prior to the housing element. Jurisdictions must then identify for the state that they have enough adequate and suitable sites to, to accommodate this housing development or accommodate the RENA. If they don't, the state law does require that cities must rezone to find additional sites to make up for any shortfall. These sites must reflect realistic capacity and be likely to redevelop within the next eight years, as well as be shown to affirmatively further fair housing and address existing inequalities. Or a program must be created to meaningfully address this deficiency. Finally, it's important to note that the lower in income portion of the arena, um, the sites that are used to accommodate the lower income portion must already be zoned at those higher density levels, uh, approximately 30 units to an acre, which allow for affordable housing. Next slide, please. So here's an outline of chapter four, uh, which I'll walk through. Again, this is a really important chapter. We'll start with the city's RENA allocation and target capacity, then describe our ability to accommodate the RENA through our adequate sites inventory and describe the resulting rezoning need that's been identified. Next slide. So first, what is our RENA? What is the RENA allocation for the city and our target capacity? Next slide. You may be wondering how this number, this RENA allocation is determined. Uh, this slide describes how the state first issues a regional determination to the Southern California Association of Governments or SCAG. SCAG represents six counties in Southern California, which are all currently working to update their housing elements. The region received a 1.3 million regional determination from the state. SCAG then prepares its own methodology to allocate the RENA, considering existing and projected needs, as well as sustainability goals, and allocates that 1.3 figure across jurisdictions. I think there's 180 across the six county region. We'll get into our numbers on the next slide, but again, each jurisdiction must identify sufficient sites that where those housing units can be built or be forced to rezone within three years. And as mentioned, failure to do so can result in significant penalties for the city. Next slide. So of that 1.3 million regional allocation, uh, the city of Los Angeles's RENA was 456,643 housing units. Uh, as you can see, that compares to 82,000 in the prior eight year cycle, which is more than five times higher than the prior cycle. And just so folks understand why the number is significantly higher, that is because of changes to state law, which said that the RENA should not just look at the projected needs in terms of births, and migrations, et cetera, but for the first time, the housing element is asked to look at existing housing needs. And those are defined as factors relating to overcrowding and the cost burden. Uh, those are both areas where we showed you the city of Los Angeles is not doing very well and therefore really contributed to a big portion of these new numbers here. 
Um, finally, on the bottom, you could see the lower income portion of that RENA, which we mentioned have specific requirements around density as such. And in total, you can see we have a big task ahead of us, and we'll spend a lot more time um, on this moving forward. Next slide, please. So the state commends also adding a buffer. Uh, on top of the RENA allocations. And the reason for this is because every city must remain, uh, must maintain its capacity above the RENA for the entire eight year period. That means if there's a site that we said could accommodate housing but is not developed as housing, we need to still make sure we have sufficient sites to accommodate the number and hence the need for a buffer. Uh, we did identify a buffer of about 10% for lower income and 15% for the moderate income categories, leading to an overall increase of about 7% uh, from ARENA, leading to a total capacity target of 486,000 units. Next slide, please. Now we'll talk about our sites and do we have enough sites that can meet ARENA and, and how we plan on meeting ARENA. Next slide, please. As mentioned previously, requirements uh, for the number establishing the arena have not only gone up, but so have the requirements to demonstrate enough sites. For example, site selection must now demonstrate a realistic potential for redevelopment within the eight year period. As well, uh, for cities like Los Angeles, where most of our sites are not vacant, they're infill sites with existing buildings, Cities such as LA are held to a higher review standard and must demonstrate to the state that with substantial evidence that all the sites that we select are indeed likely to redevelop into housing. And there's a number of factors that the state asks us to look at to, to demonstrate that. To comply with these straight, these strengthened state regulate, regulations and requirements, the draft plan includes a sort of innovative predictive model which was prepared by the Turner Center for Housing Innovation at the University of California, which helped us determine the realistic development potential for each site based really on our past production trends for similar types of properties. Next slide, please. So what does it mean to be identified as a site in the housing element? Uh, this is important because you're going to see that we included a lot of sites through the model I just mentioned in the city. So selection of a site does not mean that the site necessarily will develop with 100% confidence or that it's being targeted for any kind of growth. It just means that our model has identified existing potential for redevelopment of that site based on similar site conditions. Uh, some new requirements for all sites include that all identified sites are now required to comply with affordable housing replacement policies. This essentially means that if you develop a housing unit on a site that's identified, there can be no net loss of affordable housing on that site and the, any affordable units are replaced with dedicated affordable units. In addition, any sites that we reused from a prior housing element are also eligible now for a buy right process for that housing development on those sites that were identified previously if 20% of the units in that housing development are affordable. Next slide, please. So our, our general approach, again, was to apply what we call an econometric model or even a regression model that really determined the likelihood of sites redeveloping during the eight-year period. We then applied those results of the model to determine overall development potential uh, on those sites. We then were able to add on some additional capacity anticip anticipated through pipeline development. That's development that's already been submitted to the city for approval but has not yet been uh, finalized. Um, in addition, there's some special programs we're able to use. We'll walk through that. Um, we utilize that site to determine the consistency with our fair housing requirements and identify the shortfall and any deficiencies to inform the rezoning program. Next slide, please. So here's the numbers. Uh, here are the components of our adequate sites. As you can see, the econometric model, model uh, predicted about 45,000 units. The pipeline 
is uh, we had to kind of take the sites in our pipeline and figure out how many of those we think actually will turn into housing, and that results in 144,000 units. Um, accessory dwelling units, or ADUs, are a separate category since we don't know exactly where they will be built, but we know we've been building a lot of ADUs. We're claiming 45,000 ADUs are expected during the eight year period, which is about a 25% increase over our current levels. Finally, we include things like public land, project home key, and there's a specific area of the city called Warner Center that we also took out and treated separately because it has a cap on development. Uh, all told, adding all those up, we expect development of about 266,000 units to accommodate ARENA. Next slide, please. So here's the, the basic math here. We started out with our targeted capacity of 486,000. We subtract our expected development of 266,000 to come up with a total rezoning need of 219,732. Again, that is a rezoning that does need to occur to remain a compliant housing element and will, uh, will have to be done before October of 2024. Next slide, please. As mentioned, we analyzed our sites uh, according to a number of factors, including zoning, race, opportunity areas, tenure, renters and owners, income, family structure, seniors, et cetera, to really get a handle on the characteristics of where our sites are located. And generally, we found that our sites largely reflect the inequitable distribution of our existing zoning. As you can see on the map there, the sites are largely concentrated in areas, uh, more central areas of the city, which tend to be lower income, more renter, and uh, uh, generally lower opportunity areas. And the higher opportunity areas of the city do not have a lot of capacity. So we've concluded that there is a significant opportunity to improve these conditions through the implementation of the housing element, including the RENA rezoning program, which we'll be talking quite a lot about later. Next slide, please. So here we're gonna ask and take a, take a break and uh, we're gonna use that Mentimeter and we're gonna, we're gonna ask a poll question. I'm gonna hand it off to Wajia to, um, to get the responses from everyone on this poll question. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Matt. So like Matt said, we'll be using Mentimeter, which is uh, the platform we introduced earlier when we started the presentation. Um, in case you need to scan the QR code or if you're not using your phone and would like to access the poll from your laptops or iPads um, on the screen, you can see how to do that. Just go on menti.com and enter the code on your screen. And we'll leave that up for just a few seconds um, and continue on to the poll. So um, while, that's, while that's up, we're seeing a bunch of responses coming in already. We're asking, should the city focus a majority of the rezoning in higher opportunity areas of the city with three options? Yes, but avoid environmentally sensitive areas. Yes, but only in areas where multifamily housing is allowed today, or no. Great, we're getting quite a few responses. And it looks like most of the responses at the time are leaning towards, yes, the city should focus a majority of the rezoning in the higher opportunity areas of the city, but avoid environmentally sensitive areas. So this poll will still be up and you can continue to answer, um, but just to make sure we have plenty of time left for our Q&A, um, I'm gonna pass it back to Matt to continue on with the webinar. Thank you, Ajia. And I noticed there's a question of exactly what are, what are the higher opportunity areas? I wonder if we can just put back that slide that shows the map as well with the poll question. Just make sure folks are, are clear of what we're talking about here. These are generally areas of the city that have better access to good jobs, and good schools, and areas where children really have a great chance of succeeding in life. And these are areas that we found typically do not have a lot of housing opportunities today. 
Um, so, um, sorry, could we just put back the last slide, please, Alex? Just want to make sure people are, are able to answer this question with the information. Thank you. There's the map. So, uh, what we call high opportunity areas are those um, blue, essentially blue categories. The darker blue, the lighter blues, um, which are identified as higher resource areas of the city. Um, and so, again, yes, but avoid environmentally sensitive areas. Yes, but only in areas where multifamily or no. Really appreciate your, your responding to this poll question. Okay, thank you. I think we can move on to the next slide. Okay, so we're on to chapter five. Chapter five is really linked, uh, the very important chapter six. And chapter five asks us to comprehensively review our existing goals, our existing housing objectives, our existing housing policies and programs as they exist in the current iteration of the housing element. Uh, next slide, please. So the chapter five um, does two, has two main sections. The first is really looking at our progress of how well did we meet our current RENA goals. And the second piece looks at, again, reviewing all of the current housing element goals, objectives, policies, and programs to see how well they've worked and their appropriateness to continue, or do we need new policies to really um, reflect the, the, this, um, this moment in time? Uh, so uh, I'll walk through this very briefly here. Next slide. So in terms of the city's overall progress in meeting the arena, uh, the city has an overall target of 82,000 for the current period, as was mentioned, and this target was met in general. Um, however, insufficient housing was constructed at the lower and moderate income categories as you can see on the slide we've got a remaining rena of about 13,000 for very low income 8,000 for low and about 13,000 for moderate income um, these are uh, obviously you know super important categories that uh, a big effort of this housing element is how can we obviously produce more affordable units at those income ranges next slide please So this is a, a, a chart to really show you what that would look like to, in terms of meeting our new RENA. Uh, so we've compared the current RENA, which was about 10,000 units a year in the brown line. Uh, and these green bars are basically housing unit production levels since about 1980 all the way to 2020. And as you can see, we've been producing about 20,000 units a year in recent years, which is about double our current RENA. However, this new six cycle arena would have us building approximately 57,000 units a year, which um, obviously is a significant gap uh, to meet that, meet that level during the next period. Next slide, please. We did wanna also focus on the affordable housing situation. We mentioned we are not meeting our arena. However, recent trends have been very positive. As you can see the overall amount of affordable housing each year in the first chart on the left has been trending upwards. And in fact, the year 2020 was probably the best year in terms of affordable housing production likely in the city's history, uh, about double of, of what we've currently seen, which was about 3000 units uh, last year. However, that is still well short of the goal of about 23,000 lower income dedicated units per year. Um, we did wanna show though that there are indications that these numbers can go even higher. We wanted to show you kind of what, uh, what we're seeing in the planning department in terms of what we're approving each year and the percentage of affordable housing and going up every year from just about 7% of all housing being affordable five uh, years ago to now upwards of 20, 28% of all housing approved in the city uh, is affordable. And this is a result of new funding programs as well as the success of many of our affordable housing incentive programs. Next slide, please. Okay, so then the next we did uh, a thorough evaluation of all of the current goals, policies, and objectives and the programs really going through each program and policy to see how well they've worked. So for those of you who are interested in, in really getting deep, there's a, a wealth of information in this chapter and the, the accompanying appendix in terms of how effective and how appropriate these programs and policies are to continue. 
We identified policies that need to be strengthened or clarified, as well as identify redundancies and areas of overlap that should be eliminated or in often cases merged. And then we also added a number of new goals, objectives, policies, where those gaps remained, particularly as they relate to some of those concepts and citywide housing priorities that we've mentioned and we'll mention again. We added also a number of new programs based on existing and emerging departmental work efforts. Again, these uh, across all areas of the city, all agencies, anything housing related, tried to reflect and evaluate and identify those gaps. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is uh, chapter six now, the, the final chapter in the housing element. Um, this is really where we put all those new goals, objectives, policies, and programs that, that really guide uh, a lot of the city's work around housing for the next eight years. Next slide, please. So stemming from those concepts that we developed with the public through, the, through earlier webinars and earlier outreach and some of our online survey tools, we use those concepts, which appear to have wide support, to create what we call a set of citywide housing priorities. These priorities are, are a set of four um, Sort, sort of uh, uh, ideas, topics that are used to guide many of the new goals, objectives, and policies and programs. In fact, you see this term citywide housing priorities in many of the new goals and objectives and policies uh, as sort of a shorthand. Uh, instead of listing these out in many of our goals, we use the shorthand of citywide housing priorities, and those speak to number one, addressing the housing shortage, which is increasing the production of new housing, particularly affordable housing, to advance racial equity and access to opportunity by proactively addressing racial and economic segregation in the city and creating housing opportunities that address historic patterns of discrimination and exclusion. Third, we want all of our housing policies to prevent displacement and protect Angelenos from indirect and direct displacement and ensure the stability of existing vulnerable communities. And finally, we want these policies to promote sustainability and resilience and environmental justice through housing. Next slide, please. So chapter six, again, has this list of you know, five goals, 14 objectives, 87 policies, and 128 programs. Obviously, we can't go through all of those uh, here, and uh, we'll refer you to our, our FAQ on our website or chapter six itself, but did want to give you a highlight of some of these uh, really quickly. Next slide. So in terms of our five goals, uh, we did add a completely new goal that did not exist. That is goal two, uh, which is a new goal, just preservation, enhancing the quality of housing and providing greater housing stability. Uh, so that's a whole new goal with a number of policies and objectives that link directly to it. In addition, we have the goal around housing production. We have the healthy, livable, sustainable goal and the racially and socially inclusive neighborhoods goal. Finally, is a goal that prevents, commits the city to preventing and ending homelessness. Next slide, please. So while goals are very visionary, objectives are a little more action-oriented in terms of steps of meeting those goals. We have uh, about 14 of those. Next slide. Uh, this is a smattering of our, of our ob objectives that we felt were important to put on a slide. And again, you could spend more time with these, but objectives relate to planning for existing housing, promoting a, a more equitable distribution of affordable housing, strengthening renter protections and preventing displacement, promoting more affordable ownership opportunities, using design to really create a better sense of place, promote health as well as affirmatively furthering fair housing in all of our programs and providing an adequate supply of short-term and permanent housing, and as well as supportive housing to meet the needs of all persons, particularly those at risk of homelessness. Next slide, please. In terms of our policies, uh, many more of those, 87, these are specific statements that guide decision-making to implement the overall goals and vision. Next slide. So we have, uh, again, many, many, many policies, but we wanted to highlight those, including the, those that allocate housing targets across community plans to really address this legacy of racial and economic segregation in the city, promote a better jobs and housing balance, and promote a, uh, affirmatively further and fair housing. We also have policies on incenting the production, incentivizing the production of mixed income, and particularly 100% affordable housing. And 
ensure it can be constructed in all areas of the city, as well as maximizing the gain of affordable housing through all of our land use incentives and citywide programs, including varied affordability ratios, looking at the feasibility of inclusionary zoning and a greater mix of incomes, as well as policies on preservation, expanding ownership, and how we site buildings, et cetera. Next slide, please. Finally, are our list of 128 implementation programs. So these are actual um, actions that the city is taking that should respond to our citywide housing priorities. Next slide. And again, way too many to go through here, but um, they're grouped together here on these slides in terms of programs that help us address the housing shortage, um, everything from updating our growth strategy and improving our affordability incentive programs to expediting and streamlining affordable housing and finding new revenue sources. Uh, next slide, please. And additional examples of key programs relating to racial equity and access to opportunity is again to to indeed to focus the arena re required rezoning in those higher opportunity areas so it's very good to see the the positive endorsement of that idea which is which is really critical um, additional ideas again of, of creating a community housing needs assessment process to really uh, make sure all communities are, are doing their part to meet, help the city meet its arena and housing goals um, there are a number of objectives and activities under our affirmatively fair housing programs, as well as new types of ownership opportunities, including shared ownership and the ability to create smaller, more affordable home ownership opportunities. Um, a number of programs under preventing displacement, including a affordable housing registry, the eviction defense program and extending that, as well as expanding housing replacement and right to return policies uh, to a greater types of projects. Next slide, please. We also have programs here about promoting sustainability and resilience, as well as preventing and ending homelessness. And in the interest of time, I'm going to move past this slide as well. Next slide. Okay, um, so we've made it through the plan, but we did want to spend a little extra time here describing something really important. Uh, which is program 121 in chapter six, um, the RENA rezoning program. Again, this is uh, the way that the city will accommodate its RENA for having that shortfall. Um, we wanted to make sure that was given enough time and, and emphasized here. Next slide, please. So here are our general considerations, including the, the numbers and our goals, including a minimum of 219,000 total units, which need to be rezoned by 2024 and a minimum of 121,000 of those must be planned for lower income. That is they must have certain um, allowance for 16 units as well as certain density uh, allowances to achieve lower income housing. Next slide please. Uh, so the rezoning measures will occur over three years uh, including a variety of different measures so it will not just be one package of rezoning, it'll likely be a number over the three-year period, including any community and neighborhood planning activities that are already in the works. Those will be able to be counted towards rezoning. There may be citywide rezoning ordinances or efforts, um, looking at particular types of properties, as well as expanding the use and the where our affordable housing incentive programs can apply. Uh, so those are three kind of buckets that you may see. Next, next slide, please. So what we really want to focus on is an equitable rezoning strategy. And so that does involve focusing a majority of the additional capacity in those higher opportunity areas of the city. However, at the same time, we need to protect vulnerable communities sub that are vulnerable for displacement and housing pressures, particularly tenants. We also want to make sure we protect ecologically sensitive areas, including sea level rise areas and our very high fire severity zone areas in our hillsides. Within that, we want to consider the creation of a diversity of housing types, which includes expanding more naturally affordable housing typologies, as well as greatly increasing the number of deed restricted or income restricted affordable housing options. So to do that, we want to expand the city's existing affordable housing incentive programs to include a wider array of areas and project types and then create 
more inclusive developments, including those with enhanced community benefits, including longer and permanent affordability terms, more affordable units and more affordable incomes mixing in projects, strengthened housing replacement and right of return requirements, and greater sustainability and mobility features. Next slide, please. In terms of the geographic areas more specifically being looked at, and again, we're gonna be looking at um, a more parcel specific information a little later in the process, but in terms of general areas we're looking at, we're looking at areas near jobs and transit, including these new Metro Next Gen bus lines, which have really excellent all day service. We're looking at our regional centers in our downtown areas of the city. We're looking at our commercial and residential corridors in particular, including our boulevards and avenues, as well as transitional areas that are right off the commercial barriers, the sort of transition from a more commercial area into the residential area. There may be opportunities in those transition areas. Next slide, please. Next, yeah, we're also uh, looking a little more detailed at, at certain particular zones, such as our parking zones, which do not allow housing today. Uh, we're looking at particularly public land, as well as religiously owned land as opportunities to build affordable housing. We'll also be looking at certain industrial areas of the city, particularly those areas where there's not a great concentration of jobs or, or production actually happening, and that are conducive to more mixed income a mixed um, mixed use development as well as areas where multifamily and therefore affordable housing are not permitted today including areas that have been historically down zoned next slide please uh, we are also looking at lower density residential areas to create opportunities for a variety of missing middle what we call low scale housing typologies which could include fourplexes townhomes and row houses additional affordable ADUs, bungalow courts, and other types of contextual Los Angeles typologies that we've seen built in the city for hundreds, 100, of year, 100 years, um, as well as properties with certain characteristics, including alleyways, large lots, and residential corners. Next slide. And finally, there may be an opportunity to expand some of our affordable housing incentive programs to provide um, more streamlining including projects that include additional community benefits, affordable housing projects should be streamlined, senior housing, housing for persons with special needs, as well as projects developed by community land trusts, cooperatives, nonprofits, and adaptive reuse of old buildings into housing, as well as smaller lots, small subdivisions, and micro units in some areas as well. Next slide. And we are still developing this program. However, we did want to get some initial input on how would you prioritize some of these strategies? We couldn't put them all on the slide, but uh, we wanted to put up five potential rezoning strategies and areas uh, to get your feedback on those. And I'll hand off to Wajia. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. So yes, once again, we'll be switching to the Mentimeter platform. And in just a second on your screen, you will see um, a QR code and also how to access menti.com um, if you're not using a mobile device. And so while that's on the screen, uh, I'll read off the poll. Um, like Matt said, these are programs we're still developing and we wanna know how you would prioritize these strategies. Um, how, would you, how would you prioritize these options? A, areas near jobs and transit, near commercial and residential corridors, near certain industrial areas, near public and religious owned land, or near existing lower density residential areas to create opportunities for a variety of missing middle or lower scale multifamily housing. And let's see the responses coming in. OK, 
Okay, so it looks like areas near jobs and transit seems to be a first priority for most people. And then commercial and residential corridors coming in at a close second. Great, feel free to continue um, adding your responses to this poll, we will have it open. But again, to save more time for the question and answer portion of the webinar, I'm gonna pass it back to Matt to continue. Yes, I think we're actually uh, moving on to the safety element portion of our of our presentation. So I'm going to hand it off to unmuted off to our safety element team. Take it away. Thanks so much, Matt. Um, I'm, my name is Ari Brisky. I work with the Department of City Planning on the General Plan Update team, and I'm going to try to quickly take us through two um, more limited updates we have proposed to two other elements of our general plan, specifically the safety element and the health element, which is also known as the plan for a healthy Los Angeles. Next slide, please. Uh, so like the housing element, the safety element is a general plan element that we are required to maintain by state law. Uh, it has been since 1975, and the state sets specific parameters for what we need included within the safety element. And these parameters are really focused on this idea of protecting the community from unreasonable risks associated with disasters. So safety is a broad term. It's addressed in many elements of our general plan. We've talked a lot today about how the housing element works to improve access to safe and affordable housing. Our mobility element considers the safety of individuals as they move through our transit system. And our framework element has policies around safety that apply more specifically to matters of policing and crime. Uh, so while those are safety elements within the Los Angeles general plan, uh, they are not actually considered within the official safety element of the general plan, which is much more focused on disasters and hazards. Uh, we do have a current safety element. It was adopted in 1996. And recent state law requires that as we go through this housing element update process, we're required to kind of audit that existing safety element and make updates as necessary to come into compliance with recent state legislation. So I think no one will be surprised to hear that much of this recent state legislation focuses on climate change. This has been one of our big priorities as a state and a region. Uh, and specifically that legislation focuses on kind of two aspects of climate change, the more global aspect of climate change and the more local disaster response. So globally, the state is pushing for more information on how we are going to contribute to reducing the long-term impacts of climate change by um, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, sequestering carbon, initiatives like that. And then locally, they would like to see more policy guidance on how we respond to disaster events, which we know will become more frequent and severe as the effects of climate change continue to progress. So next slide, please. Um, so with that in mind, we, have un we are undertaking an update to our safety element. Uh, the approach to this update is really to better articulate the connection between various long range hazard planning documents produced by different departments of the city of Los Angeles. So we do have a dedicated emergency management department uh, they produce a document called the Local Hazard Mitigation Plan, which maps local hazards and details related vulnerability. Uh, they also produce an Emergency Operations Plan, which has multiple annexes and details tactical response to disaster events. So through the background section of the safety element, we're working to integrate information from these documents uh, by reference. So we're hoping to reduce repetition between these many interrelated department, uh, documents. Uh, we're also making some targeted amendments to the goals, policies, and objectives of the safety element. Currently, the goals uh, broadly direct the city to prevent, respond to, and recover from disasters. We think that's a strong framework that still works, uh, but we do want to make a few amendments to really take, uh, tackle that state legislation. So we have added an exist or a new objective that really focuses on that global climate change response. Uh, and that objective was able to pull language from the Green New Deal, a plan produced by the mayor's office that outlines our local approach to climate change mitigation. We've also audited the Resilient Los Angeles plan, also put out by the mayor's office, and we've identified some strong equity language around really planning for disaster response and thinking about our most vulnerable communities to improve our resilience. 
So we've integrated a lot of that equity language into the existing goals, policies, and objectives. Finally, we've developed a program chapter. Each of these long range plans has a listing of programs. Um, it comes to several hundred programs. We've taken the, that information and summarized and then synthesized and come up with a list of 52 programs that really illustrate how the city meets those goals of disaster prevention, response, and mitigation. Next slide. Uh, so in addition to the safety element updates, we are also proposing some targeted amendments to the plan for a healthy Los Angeles. So the plan for a healthy Los Angeles is the health and wellness element of LA's general plan. It serves as the primary location of goals and policies related to environmental justice. And it was last adopted in 2015, so it's actually one of our most recent general plan elements. The plan was drafted uh, making recommendations based on a health atlas. So the health atlas maps uh, community vulnerability and ways in which specific communities shoulder a disproportionate burden related to environmental circumstances. So we have gone ahead and uh, we're working to update that data. The community health atlas was last produced in 2013. So we are producing the same maps again with more relevant uh, recent data. And then we are also working to clarify that the plan for a healthy Los Angeles is the general plan element that primarily satisfies compliance requirements for SB 1000, which is state legislation passed a couple years ago on the topic of environmental justice. Uh, we, in, we address environmental justice in many aspects of our general plan. Uh, we've talked a lot today about how the housing element does more to pursue environmental justice. We've added policy language to the safety element specific to environmental justice. But the plan for a healthy Los Angeles is the general plan element that has most of that information. So we're proposing amendments to the introduction and appendix of the document to call attention to those strong environmental justice policies and programs and try to elevate them. We're also making a few minor program additions to reflect some recent work efforts taken on by the department, um, recent equity efforts, so that we can capture that within our general plan. Next slide. Great. Uh, so these documents are also available online. We've covered them at a very high level, but you can visit the general plan update webpage and see a full copy of the safety element draft uh, and a listing of amendments to the plan for a healthy Los Angeles. So we've gone ahead and posted the URL there. Next slide. And I'm going to try to move quickly here. I think we've covered a lot of this. Uh, Jackie covered a lot of this into the introduction. Uh, but as a next step, we are going to post these slides and a recording of this webinar online on our website. A recording of the webinar is actually already available on our Facebook. We broadcast this Facebook Live, um, our last webinar on Thursday, and that recording is available on the Department of City Planning Facebook page. We are releasing a draft environmental impact report later this month. After that, we will post our final drafts and staff recommendation reports in preparation for public hearings and city planning commission in September. Finally, we're going to go to appropriate city council committees and then work for adoption by the full city council um, of all of these plan efforts later this year. Next slide. So if you have any questions, you can reach either of our teams. The housing element team is available at housingelement at lacity.org. If you have questions or comments related to the safety element or the plan for a healthy LA amendments, you can reach myself and my team at rla2040 at lacity.org. We're taking comments through September 9th, after which uh, you should submit your comments directly to the City Planning Commission. Their email is cpc at lacity.org. And if you email City Planning Commission, please do include the case number um, of the relevant projects. Uh, we will also be holding a public hearing, so you will have an opportunity to give your full, full comment. Next slide.